necessarily a lady. <laughs>
Hurley's Media for broadcasting the forums live on Cayman 27 and online. Special thanks to our corporate sponsors for this support, including Dart Organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings, and Puritan Cleaners. Mr. Will Penu, our Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber, will be tonight's moderator. He will now explain the rules of the forum and he will then introduce this evening's candidates. Good evening. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions as prepared by our membership and, our gen and the general public. You'll have two minutes to respond to each question if you choose to do so. One ring indicates that you have 30 seconds remaining in your response time. Two rings means that you should have, you should wind up your response. Each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption and is free to differ with an opinion or position of a fellow candidate during their allotted response time. We ask that candidates deal solely with the issues and no personal attacks will be tolerated. And at the conclusion of question time, we'll accept written questions from the audience and I would ask, as Paul did a few minutes ago, that your questions be directed to all the candidates. And at the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will be allotted a two-minute closing statement. When we return from this break, we'll introduce the candidates in this, this evening's forum. Please stay tuned. Elite Marble and Granite exclusively introduces Santa Margarita Quartz. Elegant and resistant, Santa Margarita Quartz is the ideal surface for high traffic and everyday use. It can also be up to 25% cheaper than Caesar Stone and Sile Stone. Santa Margarita is exclusively by Elite throughout the entire Caribbean with the largest stock in quartz. Call 945-9028 or visit us online at Elite.ky. Elite Marble and Granite, where perfection costs less. If you're looking for extra savings and free benefits with car insurance and home insurance, Brit K has just the cover you need. There's a free $250 gift voucher for new home insurance customers too. And 10% car insurance discount if you have home insurance. With a claim service that's quick and friendly, we call it cover without added costs. Call for a quote on 949-8699 or visit BritK.ky. Brit K, where people come first. The Gillette World Sports Show is all about reinventing the way we look at sports. This program will check out the biggest global sports action from a different perspective. From technology to training to cutting edge science. Don't you just love that feeling? You gotta get everything you have. It's about precision and the difference between winning and losing. Tune in to Cayman 27 Saturdays at 7 p.m. and Mondays at 1 p.m. for Gillette World Sports. Make the most of your morning at Burger King with Burger King's unbeatable breakfast special. Two croissant sandwiches for just $4. Take two bacon, egg, and cheese croissant sandwiches, two sausage, egg, and cheese, or mix and match. Add a refreshing OJ or delicious hash browns, plus tea or coffee for a true breakfast of champions. Two croissant sandwiches for just $4, available until 10.30 weekdays and 11 a.m. on weekends. Only at Burger King. Seven Mile Beach, Waterfront, Walker's Road, Town Center Plaza, and now Red Bay. Welcome back to the Cayman Islands Further Education Center Hall, where we have two of the four candidates for Georgetown West constituency. It gives me great pleasure to introduce each of the candidates this evening, and I'll begin as they're seated with Mr. Elio Solomon. He was first elected to the Legislative Assembly for the first time in 2009, where he served as the fourth elected member for the District of Georgetown. Mr. Solomon also had experience working with the government prior to this time, having served as a technical support and procurement manager and overseeing a workforce within the Computer Services Department. He also chaired the Infrastructure Committee that drafted legislation to improve telecom pricing and services through competition. Mr. Solomon is seeking election as an independent candidate for Georgetown West. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Denny Warren, Jr. is a photographer by profession, but has been involved in community activism since 1996. 
He was formerly the president of the People for Referendum, and his efforts led to the inclusion of a referendum option in the 2009 Constitution. He also helped to form the Constitutional Working Group and represented their views at the United Nations in 2003. Most recently, he successfully campaigned for the legalization of, of medical cannabis. Mr. Warren is seeking election as an independent candidate for Georgetown West. Welcome. Thank you. I now turn it over to Mr. Paul Biles, who will pose the first question for this evening's forum. Thank you, Will. Our first question is to Mr. Ilya Solomon. And as we mentioned earlier, all questions will be asked to both, both candidates. Explain why you have decided to run for election in 2017, and why should Georgetown West voters elect you as their candidate of choice? Right, well, good evening, gentlemen. And let me just first of all say uh, very quickly that uh, and express that it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the chamber for what they're actually doing and for having done it for 30 years. I'll also very quickly express my discontent that uh, the other two persons who are running in this particular constituency couldn't make it today. I think that's sad when we can't get that level of transparency that's going to allow the voters to be able to make an informed decision. Uh, very quickly, I had the privilege, first of all, over many moments of my life to actually engage in public service. Many of them was, uh, I think even Will will recall, being involved, for example, in the e-business advisory board, being involved with liberalization of telecommunication, and a myriad of different things, even before getting elected to office in 2009. And having had an opportunity to be elected in 2009, I was able to do quite a bit of things. In fact, I think I, I can boast a little bit in terms of at least 35 accomplishments. Some of those would be very familiar to some persons, namely like the pensions, which to date over 1,134 families have benefited from that pension and has arguably put over $400 million of spend into the economy. And a myriad of different things and I believe if anything what I would hope to do is that the people of Georgetown West would give me an opportunity to be to serve again in office so I can complete a lot of what I've already started and I've also engaged not just as a public figure in terms of doing community work but as a private citizen even just recently I was also involved with renovations of the park again putting in Wi-Fi and I really love serving the people of this country generally and I'm hoping for an opportunity to continue doing just that. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Mr. Warren, I'll pose the same question to you. Explain why you have decided to run for election in 2017, and why should Georgetown voters elect you as their candidate of choice? Thank you for the question. Good evening, and good evening to the audience here and those watching at home. I, too, would like to um, express uh, my disappointment that the other two candidates didn't show up. Uh, particularly because I'm sick in two ways. I have a flu and I have a back injury that I'm going to have treatment for tomorrow. I'm actually in pain. And I can't think of a reason why they shouldn't be here. Um, there are a number of reasons why I am running for office. Uh, one of them is that after engaging many people and hearing their stories, as I um, sought to have the law change regarding cannabis. Uh, the things that people have said to me uh, really touched me, and it made me realize how much people desire to have someone who truly cares about their issues and the things that matter to them. And it was really the thing that pushed me over uh, into making the decision. Yes, um, I could list a number of things that I've done in the past, even with the chamber. Uh, and uh, I think it's an important organization. And the, I think the opportunity that you're uh, giving us tonight to be able to have this important conversation with the public and the, and the degree of trans, um, um, uh, the degree of transparency that it offers the public before the vote, I think is a very important thing. Thank you. Next question concerns crime and public safety. If elected, and this one is posed to Mr. Warren first, 
If elected, what initiatives would you introduce in Georgetown West to reduce crime and improve public safety? I believe that the way to really deal with crime is to reach, have each person in society understand the importance of dealing with crime. We we can't incarcerate ourselves out of crime. Even, even measures that, that I would propose in terms of how people can defend themselves isn't going to get rid of crime. They're important, but they're not, but they're not going to get rid of crime. The best hope that I think we have is to have an education system and, and a culture in our society that wants to do the right thing, that will put in the hard work to socialize our young people into understanding why it's important to do the right thing and how the, the negative impacts of crime are really costly to society. Our best hope, I think, is to have people understand and, and want, want to follow the law and not um, not bring society down in that way. Thank you. Same question to Mr. Solomon. If elected, what initiatives would you introduce in Georgetown West to reduce crime and improve public safety? Thank you very much for the question. I, first of all, let me say that I believe that the, the old adage is, is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so I believe that whatever preventative measures we can take, that is perhaps the best option that we have. Saying that, I've had an opportunity, not just from a distance, but up close, to see the benefits of community policing. And I'm talking about living in an area where we consider very disadvantaged and actually seeing a, a police officer there almost 24 hours a day and watch it turn into sort of a ghost town in a positive way. The streets were clean, and so I'm a very firm believer in community policing, and to be quite frankly, I don't understand why the police force is not necessarily pushing really forward with community policing. So I, I push for the community policing. In addition to that, on the whole issue of prevention, I, I see very little to none in terms of educational processes taking place by the Royal Cayman Islands Police to educate businesses and individuals about things that they can do to help avoid a crime from taking place in the first place. For example, you know, not having a five-foot hedge, but perhaps a two-foot one, making it less place for someone to hide. Or let's not leave the cell phone or certain things in your car. Little simple things you can do for the private individual and for businesses that can also avoid crimes from taking place uh, in, in the first instance. So I think there's a myriad of different things. And let me also share another experience. I even offered to the Royal Cayman Islands Police to, able, to even be able to do videos where we could actually go ahead and educate the public, both the individuals coming here and otherwise, on yes, you know, you can't smoke pot in the Cayman Islands or you're not allowed to carry a gun. And they didn't even take me up on the offer and that was free. So in very short order, I would definitely introduce um, community policing, increase that, and also increase that educational process to be able to help better inform private individuals and businesses as to what they can do to avoid the crime taking place in the first place. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Next question concerns district priorities, and we're going to focus on infrastructure. I'll start with you, Mr. Solomon. What three infrastructure projects would you recommend for completion by the next government, and how would you propose to pay for them? Well, first of all, I have, I have been proposing, I think many persons know, but I think that there are some major issues that needs to be addressed in this country, namely like cost of living, diversifying the economy and self-sufficiency. I think one of the things that I would really be pushing for if I'm elected is going to be areas such as medical research. And that is not necessarily a big infrastructure project, but it will require some infrastructure, but I believe it's key in order to be able to start to diversify the economy and start to bring money in and to create additional jobs uh, in, into this country. And so in terms of other infrastructure projects, I definitely think that the, the runway in one way, shape or another needs to be expanded because we want to be able to actually accommodate the, the trans... Atlantic flights, I think that that will allow us to not necessarily be overly dependent on the present market, namely the United States, and that also is going to be able to increase those air arrivals and stay over visitors as well. 
I definitely believe that there's a little bit of contention in terms of perhaps some people's mind as to whether we need a port or not. And there may be an issue in terms of where we're going to place it, but I honestly believe we need a port. If you look at that situation, it's about a 2% transfer rate between cruise tourism and still with visitors. There are, there are companies that sit in a mall and pay very dearly to have a corner lot. And they have a corner lot because they know that the majority of people are going to enter in through there, and that's going to increase their business. It's a bit the same, I think, when it comes to the whole issue of the port. So clearly, airport, a seaport, and I definitely want to push towards the, the capital and whole issue of diversifying the economy via medical research. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Mr. Warren, same question posed to you. What three infrastructure projects would you recommend for completion by the next government, and how would you propose to pay for them? The first is I would want um, all of our educational facilities to be um, have all the needs of the educational facilities met. Uh, it's disheartening to hear people talk about not being able to afford, afford things um, in our school system. Um, the other would be uh, the road network that, is, that, that would be feeding, for example, this area. I know that there's work taking place on the Linford Pearson Highway, um, but how does that traffic feed into this area and how the traffic get out of here? And can we do so um, without having massive uh, congestion every single morning. I think a better flow of that traffic is something that I would like to see. Uh, I would like to see, I know that the court, that there's been a call for more space at the courthouse. I, I think it's wrong that cases um, get delayed because uh, we're dealing with inadequate space and facilities for courtrooms to meet and for decisions to be rendered um, within reasonable amounts of time. That, that's, a gr that's a great travesty. I would like to see that, that done. Um, I would like to see the, um, at the airport, I would like to see covered um, passageways from the planes to the terminal. I know that the government has decided to leave that out, but I actually think that's an important um, thing for us overall. How we'd pay for it? I th like all projects, uh, the infrastructure uh, impact uh, should be assessed and fees should be paid in relation to that. Uh, if we don't do that, then we can't pay for it. Thank you. Next question will be on healthcare, and we will start with you, um, Mr. Warren. Healthcare costs have become one of the highest ex expense items in the national budget, and certainly for families as well. What reforms, if any, would you propose to address this situation? Well, I've had the opportunity to um, use the services of the HSA and I've had the opportunity to use the services of the of Health City. And there seems to be something very different taking place at Health City than it is at the HSA. And I would like to investigate all of the reasons as to why that is the case. I would like to sit with those who are experts in providing uh, patient-centric health care and, and come up with a better answer. I'm not going to purport to you that I have all of the answers here tonight, but if I see one organization operating with lower costs and the other isn't, it causes me to question why. And, and I think we can easily find out what that, that question is. Thank you. And how, how do we pay for it? Um, there, there will, we're always going to have to, I think, look out for those who are less fortunate and cannot um, pay for certain things. And of course, that means that we will have limits on how, how much we will be able to help people um, in that way. But, but I think that 
we should look at what insurance, what legal liabilities are doing into the healthcare uh, facility. I think one of the things that the, the health service, that Health City did, was sought to have um, legal liabilities limited in certain situations. Um, we might want to think about how we can benefit from that in other ways uh, when it's not talking about the negligence of an individual in the organization. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, same question. Healthcare costs have become one of the highest expense items in the national budget. What reforms, if any, would you propose to address the situation? I'm going to assume that you're talking specifically about the cost that government is having to, to bear, or is it just generally in terms of private individuals as well? And the national budget. Let me just say that, that first of all, if we actually look at health care, it is a situation where, in my opinion, is arguably out of control now. The cost is hurting individuals and it's hurting businesses. If you actually look at the legislation that was started in 1996-97, it was actually meant to deal with issues of hospitalization, not dealing with everyday issues. And I've actually done the calculations, and if you actually take an individual, a standard employee, over three years, you're probably going to expend about $600 on sort of standard sort of checkups at the hospital. Whereas if you had paid the insurance over three years, you're talking thousands of dollars. I honestly believe that we need to actually look at getting back a little bit to what we actually started with in 96, 97. My proposal would be is that I think that this country needs to create something like a medical fund, very similar to the pension fund, where individuals can contribute to it, and they can definitely have those hospitalization issues covered when, when, if and when it actually occurs. And particularly when persons reach that age of retirement, which is when they really need it the most. In addition to that, I can tell you that from a government perspective, there's about 1,400 indigents and it costs the government about $3 million every year. And in terms of that right now, that can also be remedied from this fund. I believe strongly in trying to give free medical care, and I say free as much as possible to our elderly and to our younger persons. And I don't see any reason, gentlemen, why we couldn't even have a lot of our doctors who sit here and they make a good, have a good living in the Cayman Islands, and I like that, because I want to be able to, to increase our opportunities for persons in the private sector. But why couldn't we even have a rotary system where some of them say, I'm gonna take care of one or two patients a month on a free basis? If you did that, you remove the 1,400 persons that are now relying on the government and costing $3 million a year. I believe it can be done. And just to confirm what my colleague has said, having been involved in the negotiations with Dr. Shedda, we did cap the limitations in terms of that insurance. And it has allowed them right now to, rather than charging 120,000, they can do a seam surgery for 50. I believe that there's remedies, and if I'm elected, I'm going to implement them. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Okay, so now we go a little bit more local again, starting with Mr. Solomon. Georgetown West includes the community of Windsor Park. What plans would you introduce to improve the quality of life for the residents who live in Windsor Park? Thank you very much, good question. First of all, I, I'm, I'm gonna start with one of my favorite things, I'm gonna start with the park. One of the things I'm going to do is to continue to where I started in terms of refurbishing to make sure that that's a community center piece. And I think it's very important. It might be easily overlooked, but very important because it helps to bring communities together. I've also got plans where I've actually talked to individuals, not just thought about it, but talked to individuals who are willing to come here and bring businesses. That includes the assembling, for example, of solar panels. Why do I mention that? Because I believe that the, the assembling of that is going to create employment, but it's also going to allow us to be able to install that in many homes at an affordable price and be able to reduce persons' electric, electrical bill down to 10% of what it is. And I stress that by also saying that I've also talked to investors who are willing to say, we're willing to go ahead and put that $25,000 up front to allow a lot of these persons to be able to put it on their premise and actually pay on a monthly basis because that's one of the negatives and the impediments holding people back from being able to turn to this alternative energy. That's also going to be requiring some modifications to be made via ERA as it relates to CUC, but I believe that can be done. So one, I'm talking about lowering the cost of living for those individuals because when they get more disposable income, that's going to be able to help things improve. I'm also a person that's very big on beautification 
persons may remember that while I was in office on the Pride cleanup, over 800 persons in this country was employed cleaning up. I definitely would start a program immediately in terms of getting persons out, getting the neighbors out, actually making that place look as beautiful as it can, as it can be. And that again might be something that some person may seek to ignore, but I think it was Mr. Ruta Giuliana in, in New York who actually realized that that broken window effect works. When he started to clean the trains and fix the broken windows, crimes reduced. Windsor Park and the whole of Georgetown West is a wonderful and beautiful community. What it needs in there is someone who actually cares, and I believe I have the caring, and I believe I have the plans to actually make it a better community. Thank you. Mr. Warren, same question. Georgetown West includes the community of Windsor Park. What plans would you introduce to improve the quality of life of the residents who live there? I would seek to make all, um, uh, any, any of those who are um, unemployed, uh, give them access to whatever skills or information they need in order to be able to deal with the economic challenges that they have. Uh, that, that would include utilizing uh, a lot of the facilities that, and, and programs that the chamber uh, runs to, to, to make that available to them. Because a lot of the challenges that, that people face are economic related. Um, whether a person, let's say you have a, a family that's struggling to make ends meet. Um, and they have to work two jobs, and it's not paying that much. Um, that, that family is going to find it very hard to spend the quality time that they need with their kids in order for their kids to have a good education and so forth. And so by, by increasing their ability to earn more money, they will uh, improve their lifestyle. One of the things that also needs to be dealt with is the flooding that takes place uh, in Windsor Park. I don't have a specific a solution for that, but I, I would imagine that, our, that engineers in, uh, in the Cayman Islands could come up with a way in which it can be addressed. Um, crime, that's back to education as I described earlier. We, we, need, we need people to to appreciate why it's in their best interests to not engage in crime. And, and that will give a, a sense of, a better sense of safety, not only in the environment, but parents would have less worrying about their kids getting injured and involved in drugs and whatever else. Um, I think crime is a significant one that we need to actually deal with. Well, thank the candidates. We've completed the first round of questions. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back after these messages. Elite Marble and Granite exclusively introduces Santa Margarita Quartz. Elegant and resistant, Santa Margarita Quartz is the ideal surface for high traffic and everyday use. It can also be up to 25% cheaper than Caesar Stone and Sile Stone. Santa Margarita is exclusively by Elite throughout the entire Caribbean with the largest stock in quartz. Call 945-9028 or visit us online at elite.ky. Elite Marble and Granite, where perfection costs less. Some side effects of radiation can affect a patient's appetite. Here are some tips for maintaining good nutrition while undergoing treatment. Eat frequently. Eat small portions of calorie-dense foods. The goal is to maintain your weight while going through therapy. Concentrate on liquids and soft foods. These will be easier to swallow. Although it may become difficult to eat, try as best as you can to maintain good nutrition. Visit the local Cayman Islands office at Governor Square or call 749-3304. Some say the time of miracles has passed, but we see miracles all around us every day. Some could not walk. Some could not breathe. Some had lost all hope, but something amazing happened. Something that can't be analyzed or quantified. Something that is more than good medicine. Holy Cross.
The world is getting smaller. We travel more. We see more. We do more. So you need a bigger health plan like Premier Health. You have easy access to benefits at home. One million U.S. providers accept your ID card for college, vacation, and business travel. With 24-7 worldwide assistance, U.S. pharmacy benefits, and 96% of claims settled in five days, Premier Health offers you the care you deserve. Brit K, where people come first. BritK.ky Welcome back to the Cayman Islands Further Education Center Hall, where we have two of the four candidates for Georgetown West constituency, Mr. Elio Solomon and Mr. Denny Warren, Jr. We've gone through the first round of questions. We now turn to the subject of pensions, so I turn it back over to Paul Biles. Thanks, Will. The next question, we will start with uh, Mr. Warren. What is your view regarding the recent changes to expatriate pensions? And do you believe that this will have a negative impact on the tourism product in the Cayman Islands? I think that pensions are designed for a specific purpose, and that's to provide for income later in life when one has is not able to work or decides not to work for whatever the reasons are or, or, or want to work less. I believe that we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we were to allow people to simply take out of their pension funds and then return to the Cayman Islands and run the risk of becoming a burden to society. That's one of the safety mechanisms that we've put in place so that individuals don't become a burden on the state. And, and to allow that to be undermined, I think, is a mistake. I think people should seek to understand why that's not beneficial and not engage in it. I like the idea that people can transfer their money to another country if they, if they choose, um, because I think whatever is giving people the freedom to do with their assets in that way that, that doesn't run the risk of becoming a burden to the state, I like. Um, one, of the, one of the unfortunate things, however, is that the, the amount of money that is being uh, contributions being made to accounts will not provide sufficient funding upon retirement. That, that is true not only for government pensions, but it's true for private sector pensions. And I think, if I remember correctly, the, the amount is in the region of 30, 25 percent that it would provide for public pensions and uh, a little less for private pensions. Thank you. Same question to Mr. Solomon. What is your view regarding the recent changes to expatriate pensions? And do you believe that this will have a negative impact on the tourism product in the Cayman Islands? Well, let me just say, first of all, I disagree with my colleague. I think that it's going to have a negative impact, and I think you will end up with a significant number of persons leaving this country, and it's going to have a negative impact. And so I don't agree with it. And let me just talk a little bit because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to the pension. I think my colleague has perhaps made that clear. For example, when you talk about pensions, we just think about cash in the bank when it comes to retirement, but that's really not what pensions and retirement's all about. It's 33% to make sure that you have shelter, which is very important. It's the supplementary things like, like your water and your electricity and your food. And it's also about your medical care. And that's according to the Mercy Report, March 26, 2007. If you actually did the calculations, here's what the math would tell you. If a young man or young woman came out of school at 18 years of age and worked until they retired at 6 or 6 to 5, they would not have contributed more than $252,000 directly into their pensions. Yet, for example, I brought a pension amendment withdrawal that allowed them to draw up to $35,000. If you took that $35,000 from the $252,000, you're still left with approximately $220,000. 
Well, what would you rather, an individual directly put in 220 but have no house, or put in 252 with no house, or 220 with having a house? That shelter is secured. And so I just say that to talk about the fact that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the pension. One of the things we're able to do is to secure that residence, for example, for persons. And you can do that with the 33% and it only costs you 35. In terms of the expatriates leaving the country, I am a proponent that at the end of the day, this must be a fair and equitable society. Those persons who actually came to this country came with a legitimate expectation that they would work and they'd be able to leave and carry their pensions with them. To change that in itself is ethically and financially wrong. And the pension companies, their big objective is to keep as much money as long as possible. And they can use any excuse they want, but that's exactly what they're doing. It is not going to negatively impact Caymanians and it's going to negatively impact our workforce. And our workforce is extremely important. And for those who may want to say it's an expat thing, it is not an expat thing, it is a local thing. When we hurt our economy, we are hurting locals. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Um, next question is on education, and we'll start with you, um, Mr. Solomon. Education has been identified by chamber members as the top issue of this year's election. Do you agree, and if yes, what recommendations would you propose to the next government to improve the education system of this country? I think it's, a, I think it's an awesome question. I, I get a little bit radical, perhaps, when it comes to education. I believe that we have to accept that every single person in this world are practical learners. The majority of things that we learn, I don't care whether it's using the potty or whether it's using a cell phone, we learn it in a practical way. Nobody sent us to school. We're practical learners, but they have some persons who excel on the abstract. And I think if we're going to create the best society that we can, we need to engage in as much practical learning as possible. We need to get our young children in the, in the workforce, get them out there doing practical things as early as possible. One of, the thi one of the challenges you have is that I remember going to school learning to try to do algebra. I asked my math teacher, I said, what's this for? She said, fish and chips. That made no sense to me. It wasn't until years later on that I went to college to do electronic engineering that everything started to make, make sense as to why I was using algebra. So I say that to say this. The big problem with a lot, reason why a lot of our young persons are not necessarily learning is they have no practical application for the knowledge of which you're trying to convey to them. When we can give them that practical experience and then combine it with the abstract, I think you're going to improve the lives of those individuals and therefore the families and therefore the community in this country. And that's what I want to do. And I don't want to just call it on the general caption of vocational training. It's about getting a, when the, when the African adage says that it takes a village to raise a child, well, this is it. Let's get them out there, practical experience, combining it with the abstract, abstract and getting individuals coming out saying, not only I've learned, I'm excited and I love learning. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Warren. Education has been identified by chamber members as the top issue of this year's election. Do you agree, and if yes, what recommendations would you propose to the next government to improve the education system of this country? I do agree. And I would propose that the government take steps to make sure that no kid will go to school hungry because no kid is going to care about the fact that Paris is the capital of France if they're hungry. They're not going to be interested in what the teacher has to say. And I know there's a lots of, there are a number of great organizations that are taking uh, steps to try to limit um, hunger uh, in, in families in the Cayman Islands. But I think it happens too much. I agree with uh, Mr. Solomon about the practical aspect of education. Uh, unless there's a connection to the, the physical world and the understanding of how uh, what is being taught um, will, can result in the, in the creation of a physical product that could be made uh, for sale uh, to the public. Uh, kids just tune out. Uh, I, I would say that I would like to see uh, an emphasis on science uh, because medical is becoming um, more uh, 
um, available to local population for, um, for work, even for business opportunities, whether it be business to business um, companies or whether it be services to the public uh, directly. Um, the, I've, I've been made aware of, of things that I can't really talk about, unfortunately, but it's quite disturbing to me that some people would put those types of stumbling blocks in front of our kids. Um, our kids and, and not be able to make those types of facilities available to them to do the kind of practical learning that Mr. Solomon is talking about. Thank you. Next question is on uh, leadership, starting with Mr. Warren. If elected, would you accept a ministerial seat? And what areas of responsibility would you be willing to take on? Yes, I would. And the areas of responsibility could be planning, health, agriculture, ICTA. Um, there are a number of things that I think need to be done in the country. One of the ways in which I believe that we need to change government is with e-government. We live in a time in, in which we should be taking advantage of the efficiencies that technology makes available to us. Um, one of, the, one of the, the things that I think is that persons should not have to go to an office to do something unless you're absolutely required to collect something physically. If it can be done electronically, it should be done electronically. And I believe that what that will allow us to do is to improve customer service. One of the, um, one of the ways in which I believe that I could be helpful if I were in, the, in a um, ministerial position, for example, in planning, one of my things is I believe that we need a proper development plan for the country. The haphazard way in which we develop today is not going to serve us well in the long run. Traffic congestion is one of the examples that I could give as to, uh, to that, that demonstrates how we fail to plan properly. We're going to duplicate those mistakes in other areas if, if we're just haphazardly developing. And um, I would like to see a development plan. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, if elected, would you accept a ministerial seat? And what areas of responsibility would you be willing to accept? If and when elected, I would accept a minister's seat. I would be honored to do so. And I would choose to have the areas of pensions, health care, agriculture, and e-government. Pensions, one, because I, I'm very familiar with it. I think most persons understand a lot of the things that I've actually done. I also want to reverse some of the amendments that I've actually seen being made. But most importantly, I believe that our pensions need to come back home. We're just investing it in Europe, Asia, and everywhere else to do the same things we could be doing right here in this country. So I want to push for that investment to be taking place on our own infrastructure, not somebody else's. In terms of health care, I definitely want to push forward this project, which when we talked about funding earlier on, let me stress, this is a, a privately funded thing. Private individuals can do this. This doesn't require very, very little intervention from government other than legislation, of which I have already drafted and would perhaps just require a little bit of tweaking by the government once elected. Also, in terms of, and again, that's for medical research, Agriculture, I'm big on agriculture at the end of the day because I'm big on health. And I think we need to be eating fruits off our own trees. And if we're not going to eat fruits off our own trees, ideally get the fruits as close as possible. So one, I want to go east and free up a lot of the locked land so that we can actually open it up for development, including agricultural development. I also believe that nothing is preventing us from even going to other countries that have successful running farms, and even where necessary, purchasing those farms, again, perhaps through some sort of public-private partnership, and engaging in direct shipping to this country to lower the cost of food products. I believe that that's possible. 
and of course increasing our health as well. On the e-government side, I definitely want to say I agree. That is the best way to, to perhaps engage in efficiency and effectiveness of service in the public. I had an opportunity to be the first chairman of the e-government board in the government. I engaged in things, for example, like the prison link, which meant that all of a sudden the buses that were running between the prison and the courts no longer had to go, saving government $2.8 million. I created the ECID or the e-services ID. When it's fully implemented, you can have things like a national ID reducing costs and also creating universality of services, which means when you go to immigration, it's the same as customs. You can pay your bill anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Our next question will focus on economic diversification, starting with Mr. Solomon. The two main economic pillars are financial services and tourism. These pillars are vulnerable to external economic shocks. Would you support diversification into other industry sectors? If yes, which sectors would you seek to attract? to the Cayman Islands. Sure. And let me just first of all put this in context. I do agree in terms of diversification. I believe it's absolutely required. I remember a couple of years ago looking at the, um, the whole issue of how many banks we had here and you heard the numbers like 500. Then you look a couple of years later, it's down to 250. Then I looked a couple of years later and it was 193. Now it's down to 175. Anyone that's not seen that kind of contraction in the market and not concerned about it should be concerned. That industry is under attack, and under attack as well by our own parent company, our country, who is saying, I'm going to destroy, they've made it clear, I'm going to destroy the Cayman Islands as a financial services center. So let me state this. If I'm elected and when I'm elected, I will give full support to the tourism industry and to the financial services industry. Have no doubt about that, but I believe we need to diversify. As I mentioned earlier on, one of those areas I think that we can go is medical research. As long as we're human beings, we'll have persons who are getting sick and persons who are dying. It's a wonderful industry. It's a $36 billion industry in the United States alone, and I believe that the Cayman Islands can easily capture a small percentage of that. And that would be significant revenues for the government coffers, and in addition to that, creating wonderful opportunities for companies here and individuals when it comes to jobs. I also believe, as I mentioned earlier on, that I've been in contact with persons who can actually deal with the whole assembling of solar panels in this country, and again, that creates another industry as well. So I definitely believe in diversification, and I want the public, in particular Georgetown West, to know not only do I believe in it, I've actually taken steps about it. I'm not, I've, I've not been sitting idle for the last year. I've been for the last year drafting the legislation along with a, a learned draftman, Mr. Billy Simamba, who was a draft person for the government for 12 years, already drafted the medical research legislation that we need to create a medical research authority. And if and when elected, I will work immediately to have it implemented. Thank you. Mr. Warren, our two economic pillars financial services and tourism are vulnerable to external economic shocks. Would you support diversification into other sectors? And if yes, which sectors would you seek to attract to the Cayman Islands? I do believe in diversification. Um, the first would be I support the idea of us growing cannabis locally for the purposes of uh, producing cannabis oil for medicinal purposes locally and for export. Israel is currently preparing itself uh, to do just that. And the size of the uh, market from their perspective is in the um, around 20 billion. I think that we should not sit around and wait uh, for opportunities like that to pass us by. Those types of things are well within the reach of Caymanians to do. I don't think we have to attract people to Cayman to do that. Um, the other thing that I think we should focus on is technology. Um, we live in a technological world and we should, we should at the primary school level, um, expose our kids to coding. and. And not, not for the purposes of simply getting a job in the uh, IT world, but for being developers of applications that would provide services to the public. And so as in, if individuals are, are starting their own businesses and, and owning apps, and, and those apps can be sold internationally, 
uh, I think that would be a, a wonderful opportunity for our uh, young people. Um, the other thing is that uh, we, I don't think that we should uh, for, for one second believe that, um, that the financial industry is going to just simply go away. I think it will change and I will certainly be supporting the idea of, of protecting the financial industry uh, from the kind of threats that I've seen um, out there. Thank you. Our next question is on immigration and labor, and we will start with you, Mr. Warren. Candidates in previous forums have suggested establishing a human resources authority. Would you support removing the responsibility of processing work permit applications from the Immigration Department and creating a human resources authority? Um, I would support that, yes. However, I don't believe that the act of doing that itself is going to make the work permit or even immigration issues um, better. I think the fundamental problem that we have and it seems to be a cultural one, I'm not sure why, but we don't, we don't enforce laws. We put laws on the books, and then when there is something happening, we come up with another reason to, well, come up with some other plan to deal with what we can already deal with. And so I think what we need is to have people with the courage to enforce the law. And if something needs to be denied, deny it. If you need to approve it, approve it. Give the reasons why you've taken the decision so that the public can understand and let's move the process forward. And, let, and if we need to tweak those processes, then we tweak them. But I think just simply creating another authority and not changing that culture uh, won't really make a difference. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, candidates in previous forums have suggested establishing a human resources authority. Would you support removing the responsibility of processing work permit applications from the immigration department and creating a human resources authority? Yeah, well, this, as I said very similarly last night at, at the, uh, one of the debates, the whole issue of human resource authority, first of all, is not a, a new one, and it was started from Vision 2008, which took place in 1998. And I think a lot of persons, particularly the present government, is playing a lot of politics when it comes to this whole issue of human resource authority, because they had many years to deal with the whole issue of labor. They got in and did arguably nothing for three years. But let me just say to you that I think if we actually looked at the whole issue of granting work permits, we should look very carefully at whether we want to conjoin that with one group who's trying to get people jobs and actually mix in the fact that they also give the permits. It might sound good to some, but there's a natural check and balance that would occur that you have one institution dealing with jobs and the other one who's protecting our borders and deciding who's allowed to come and who's not allowed to come here. So I don't necessarily agree with conjoining those two. I don't. And as I mentioned last night in my debate, I think the whole issue in this country is enforcement. Section 80 of the employment law clearly makes it that the government department, the labor office, is allowed to go within every company in this country and to be able to conduct investigations on discrimination, saying, hey, why is this foreign national? He was being paid 120 and the Cayman only being paid 60. You name it, they can call for the information and they can put fines. When is the last time in this country that we heard that Section 8 actually being enforced? Let's look at business staff and plan, which again is a good process that allows companies to be able to submit and for the government to look it over in terms of succession planning. But there's issues. One, there's the enforcement issue and there's a little bit of tweaking that's needed. Why, for example, is it that when an individual or a Caymanian is being designated for a position, are we checking to make sure that he and she have actually been informed? I've known of cases where it wasn't. There needs to be transparency there, and you actually again needs the enforcement to have someone going and saying on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, following up to make sure that that person is in fact being training, trained and to be able to put in that position and not to the adverse or to the contrary, being constructively dismissed. So I think enforcement is a major issue there. 
I'd like to thank the candidates. We've concluded that we, we've reached the first hour of questioning. So now what we're going to do is, after this commercial break, we're going to accept some questions from our audience. So please stay tuned. Most people want the same basic things in life. They want to be safe, healthy, happy. They want a good job. In a word, people want prosperity. So how can we create more prosperity for Caymanians? Another way to say prosperity is standard of living. There are three basic ways to improve the standard of living. First, the government can spend more money on services like healthcare, education, or infrastructure. That would make life better for Caymanians but it would also cost more money, which means more government fees. So it might bring a better standard of living, but it would also increase the cost of living. The second way to improve living standards would be to reduce the cost of living. A lower cost of living means people have more money to spend on other things. But in a modern economy for the most part, the cost of living isn't something that the government can directly control. The third way to improve living standards would be to increase salaries. Raising salaries has the same effect as reducing the cost of living because it gives people more money to spend. Hmm, if only there was some way we could increase salaries, increase government revenue, and decrease the cost of living all at the same time. There is. It's called economic growth. In the last video, we saw how companies turn revenue into four economic outputs, including duties and fees, and salaries. So in order to improve government services without increasing anyone's government fees, and at the same time increasing salaries, companies need to make more revenue so they can afford to pay more money in salaries and duties and fees. And that's what economic growth is. Companies making more revenue and turning it into more money in salaries, overheads, government fees, and profits. But wait, what about the cost of living? Is there a way economic growth can reduce the cost of living? Yes. Have you ever wondered why most things cost so much less in the United States? That's because companies there sell a much greater quantity and can therefore afford to make less on each individual sale. Economists call this economies of scale. The fact that a growing economy raises living standards and creates prosperity is one of the few things that all economists agree on. It's what people mean when they say, a rising tide lifts all boats. In the next episode, we'll start looking at how we could help the economy grow. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so that they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. Looking for quality products with the best prices? Then come to Uncle Bill's. We carry the best bicycle brands on island. You can also make a custom order and pick up items from our great line of accessories. We have a fantastic range of stainless steel, gas, and charcoal grills. And make sure to check out our great line of DeWalt power tools. Plus our newest product, the FlexVolt. Have the freedom of cordless. Come and visit us today. Uncle Bill's Home Improvement Center. If you're looking for extra savings and free benefits with car insurance and home insurance, Brit K has just the cover you need. There's a free $250 gift voucher for new home insurance customers too. And 10% car insurance discount if you have home insurance. With a claim service that's quick and friendly. We call it cover without added costs. Call for a quote on 949-8699 or visit BritK.ky. Brit K, where people come first. It's fresh, fresh from the garden, it's fresh, fresh from the baker, it's fresh, fresh from the fisherman, always have her, it's fresh, fresh from the butcher, it's fresh, fresh from the deli, it's fresh, fresh from the summer rain, always have her. At Hurley's, everything is fresh, and we mean everything. We believe that every life matters and that we are all connected. One community, one people. We believe in compassion to give dignity to those that society has let down. We strive to conquer fear and we believe that the power to heal 
is a gift. This is who we are. This is what we believe. Holy Cross. matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Welcome back to the Cayman Islands Further Education Center Hall, where we have two of the four candidates for Georgetown West. Mr. Elio Solomon and Mr. Denny Warren, Jr. We've gone through the chamber questions. Now we're turning to the audience and the general public questions. So I turn it back over to Chamber President-Elect Paul Biles. Thanks, Will. Our first question from the audience, which I will pose to Mr. Warren, is do you think the scholarship grants by government needs to be re restructured, and if elected, what would you do to fix it? I do believe that, um, I believe that more scholarships should be available to, to um, the public so that we could maximize the opportunity um, to get more Caymanians into upper management positions, into owning their own businesses, and uh, creating wealth. I would like to see Caymanians focus more on the, on the wealth creation um, through ownership rather than simply remaining in, a, in an, an employment situation for someone else. Because if we can keep, the more money we can keep locally, the better. We, we know that there are many people who, are, who have good education, but they're having difficulties finding work. We shouldn't be in that situation. We have many, many work permits in the Cayman Islands. And we have to take a, a firm position, not be afraid to deal with the issue, because at the end of the day, we should be developing the Cayman Islands for Caymanians. And I don't say that to say that I am not appreciative of people who come here, bring businesses, and help us develop the country. Obviously, I appreciate that, but what I, but what bothers me is Caymanians being left behind, not because they're not qualified, not because they don't have skills. Um, there, there are multiple of reasons which time doesn't allow me to get into, but, but just to say that yes, I do agree that if you're starting from the position of having um, a good education, that's always an advantage, but we still lack the courage to deal with the other issues. They just drag out, drag out. I think we need to replace those who don't have the courage to do so. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, do you think the scholarship grants by government needs to be restructured? And if elected, what would you do to fix it? I do believe it needs to be restructured and in several different ways. First of all, I don't think that there's, just like we don't ha have arguably a good development plan, I don't think we have a good development plan when it comes to scholarships. Let me give you an example. We approved while I was in office a Dr. Shedder project. There's now 200 rooms and it's going to expand to 2,000. They're expecting to have over 900 permits. Right now, one would expect that any government that's elected is trying to gear our young persons at least in that direction in terms of the medical industry. So right there in terms of the granting of scholarships, they should at least, at least be encouraged and aware of some of the options that exist in this country. You don't see that arguably at all. As my colleague talked about, 
uh, information technology, which I'm very keen about, that might want to be a, a key role in things. So you need to have that kind of a focus in terms of where you want to actually take the country. Another way I would actually make some changes is while I was in office, I brought an education fund. And that education fund call for a percentage, not an additional, but just a percentage of the work permit fees to be able to go into that fund for education. Some persons thought it was purely aesthetics, but it isn't. I think one of the negative things that gets constantly abandoned around in this country, particularly by politicians, for their own experience, is the anti-foreign rhetoric. If we continue down that road, we're going to have major problems. And I thought by taking that percentage of work permit fees to help fund education, Caymanians would be able to see a clear visual, because it happens now, but they'd be able to see a clear visual that the person who comes here and works is, in fact, contributing to the education of their child as well. And in addition to that, the education fund would be able to allow them to facilitate private individuals to be able to help fund education. I remember talking while I was in office to two persons who were very keen about helping to fund education, but they're not going to want to give it to one particular candidate or a political party. They want to feel like it's neutral and that it's independent. So very quickly, those are some of the things and quick reforms that I would do in terms of the scholarships. Thank you very much. Mr. Solomon, next question. We will start with you. If you are not elected, what are you going to do to aid or assist the community of Georgetown West? Also, please comment on any efforts you are involved in now, have been doing, or will do if not elected. Yes. Well, actually, quite, quite interesting. I heard someone um, post and say, what have you been doing for four years? Well, let me just say, I have expended thousands upon thousands of dollars just in terms of my, my company, Vision 3E. And Vision 3E was done pri primarily for our community to benefit. I interview individuals within our community, particularly our elderly, because I believe capturing their stories are so important. While I was in office, I encouraged the Minister of Education to go ahead and to put things in the library about some of the names of those people who are in this hero square. People are seeing those names, but the names mean nothing to them. If you, if you rob people of the story, you rob them of the real substance. I have been capturing that in real life. We've had Ms. Julia Hayes, for example, who passed away. We did an interview with her. Mr. Vernon Jackson, who, who passed away, we have an interview with him, telling his own story in his spirit and life. So one, I've been doing things like Vision 3E for the last three years. And I think that's a wonderful contribution. I will continue to do so. And of course, I always make myself available to anyone within the community. I rent out, I hooked up Wi-Fi in the park, and not only in, in Georgetown West, but I'm working to actually get that done in all of the parks, hopefully throughout the Cayman Islands. And I want to again thank ICTA for their support in doing that as well. But whatever I can do for my community, and as I was just chatting with my colleague earlier on, regardless of how the outcome of this election comes, if it was me or if it was him, Regardless of what it is, I'm happy to work along with anyone for the ben benefit of this country. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Warren, if you are not elected, what are you going to do to aid or assist the community of Georgetown West? Also, please comment on any current efforts by yourself, things that you have been doing or things that you might do if not elected. Well, hopefully that's just theoretical. Um, currently, I've, for the last almost two years, I've spent, I've pretty much been full time dealing with how do we, how do we change the culture that we have right now and the perspective we have towards a substance called cannabis. Because I've come to understand that it's not the demon that has been portrayed as uh, when used appropriately. When I, got, when I started down that road, it wasn't, because, it wasn't because I had an interest at the time. It was because I knew nothing about it and discovered that it had tremendous benefits. And the more I learned, the more I realized that a lot of the stuff we're hearing is propaganda. And so I've been spending a lot of time researching and trying to understand um, what those benefits are. 
and to inform people about those benefits. And the, the thing that I would say about that is that it's not just about treating an ailment. Um, it is about prevention as well. And prevention, I think, is an important element in healthcare related issues. I have a very specific reason why I went down this road, but I very deliberately did it in such a way that the general public would benefit from it entirely. I would continue to do that. Um, I would continue to promote good governance, participatory democracy, uh, such as recall and other things. Thank you. Next question, we start with you, Mr. Warren. What is your position on the ongoing LGBT rights debate, particularly with the recent headlines surrounding gay equality in the Cayman Islands? Uh, my personal view is that I don't favor the lifestyle, um, but as a representative, how I would act would not be in accordance with my personal view. I would seek the consensus view of the constituency and represent the constituency's view. We know that currently we have a constitutional um, provision that makes same-sex marriage, for example, um, unlawful. But in applying my mind to some of the conflicts that I read about and hear about, it's become obvious to me that we, I think we should adjust some of our laws to remove conflicts such as the one with the famous one where the gentleman uh, wanted to be a dependent. Uh, and, but I'm not, I'm not saying that we should recognize same sex in law. I'm simply saying that we should adjust the law, for example, to say that, that a person who wants someone to be here with them could, could say that that person would be a designated person, not saying that they're recognizing the same sex of anything, but make that a neutral option so that if the conflict doesn't arise, it would allow persons of that persuasion to be able to do things in society that currently they have a conflict with. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, what is your position on the ongoing LGBT rights debate, particularly with the recent headlines surrounding gay equality in the Cayman Islands? Uh, Paul, let me stress that you know I was involved a little bit in terms of the constitutional talks many years ago, and I again admonish persons in this country about the impact that that would have both in terms of the state of religion as well as the whole issue about things such as the, the gay rights. And the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that over 7,000 persons went to the polls and voted in favor of that constitution, and that constitution actually protects certain rights. And first of all, as long as that's there, I think legislators are going to find themselves to a great degree having to make sure that they're enforcing that. That said, I do not necessarily agree with that lifestyle. I can make that abundantly clear. It's not necessarily something that I actually condone. And I believe that we have always accepted that there are persons within our community that live a, a somewhat different lifestyle. And I think we've been able to get, a, get along together as still as a wonderful community. And one of the reasons I think that was always the case is because persons with that alternative lifestyle was not necessarily pushing it in other people's face. I think that there's a, a sort of new culture that's coming up, and that is not simply a matter of being able to do what you feel you want to do, but also forcing that sort of view on other persons. And it's definitely something that I do not condone. And whatever I can within reason, I will, deal to, I will do my, my best to effectively make sure that persons are not going to have their rights as far as I'm concerned, because they have rights as well. Uh, the individuals who do not want to engage in that lifestyle to have that being rammed down their throats also. Thank you. 
The current constitution, we will, uh, we will start, sorry, we'll start this, uh, Mr. Solomon, this question is yours. The current constitution has been operational since 2009. What changes do you believe need to be made for better governance in this country? Well, let me, let me say first of all that uh, I, we've already seen a couple of things, comments being made, and we saw that the government has just recently added an additional member of parliament. And I just give that as a context to show that we are to accept then that it's not a perfect document. And quite frankly, it shouldn't have been overlooked because it should have been obvious that at one point in time, you could have ended up with a, a lock parliament. But that said, I believe that the single member constituencies that are now being introduced, and I'll state this clearly as well, I think it has some positiveness. But you know what they say, at the end of the day, there's a flip side to that. There's some positive things in the sense it would bring people closer to their communities. But I have legitimate concerns about single member constituencies. I can tell you, even, uh, even by one of the persons who uh, apparently didn't show up here tonight, I had an individual call me on their behalf and threaten me about running in Georgetown West. So I can tell you that I'm concerned about where the politics is going to lead. My personal view is that we should have been moving more towards the direction of a national vote where everyone around this country could have had an opportunity to make sure that they could have a chance to be able to pick all of their board of directors, all 19, and not just one. But I believe there is some poss possible negative ramifications to come out of single member constituencies. And I believe that amongst other things in the Constitution and in the relevant legislation, we should put in place certain mechanisms that's going to help to mitigate, reduce, or to eliminate those risks, as, at least as far as I perceive them to be. Thank you. Mr. Warren, what changes do you believe need to be made to our existing constitution for better governance? I think we need to give voters the power to recall their politicians. And for those who may be unfamiliar with what that term means, that means the right of a voter in a particular voting district to terminate the employment of an MLA. We often hear political promises about what one will and will not do once elected. But as soon as they're elected, they do otherwise. The right to recall someone would short circuit those types of efforts by MLAs. I would want the government to be more transparent and release information. I would want the government to be compliant with laws about releasing information. I would want those who deliberately withhold information from the public to be prosecuted. Because without proper information, it's very difficult to make sensible decisions. It, it's very difficult for us to sit here and answer questions about the port, for example, if we don't have all the information about the port. It would be irresponsible to do so. And so for the government to have a policy that they're going to deny, say, candidates access to information so that we could make uh, um, sensible contributions, I think is wrong. I would like to see more participatory democracy in which the public uh, uh, is informed about the benefits of fully participating in the political system. I know, for example, in the effort to make cannabis oil um, lawful, what, what can really be done when, when the public is behind something. And, and I think that that gives us tremendous power to make the kind of fundamental changes that we need to propel us into a better position. Thank you very much. Another constitutional question, starting with Mr. Warren. The Constitution calls for the establishment of advisory district councils in each district. And a law was enacted to effect that. Would you introduce one if you are elected? Yes. Um, I would have preferred to see the Constitution say that they were um, that one were that the individuals were not appointed but elected. 
However, <laughs> yes, I would. Um, I think that's extremely beneficial for people to be involved in the processes of um, information flowing between the citizenry and, and, and the government. Um, in the past, I've worked on uh, bringing the uh, referendum into uh, the Constitution, and I think that petitions are something that you know, should be used only as much as, it, as is necessary. And I kind of view it more as a, as a contingency when a government doesn't r respond properly to um, the, the desires and the needs of the citizens. But if they need to use it frequently, use it frequently. And, um, but yes, I, I would like to see that kind of involvement in our communities. That would be extremely beneficial. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, the Constitution calls for the establishment of advisory district councils in each district, and a law was enacted to affect that. Would you introduce one if you're elected? Let me just say first of all, I think a lot of times I would encourage the public to look at the substance versus form, because with a lot of politicians you'll hear a lot of rhetoric, but when you actually look at the substance you get something different. And on the substance side is that when you talk about a district council, first of all, we, ought, we have to appreciate that that has already changed. Georgetown, for example, as a district has already changed. It's no longer district-wide as it was before at large, but now we have seven constituencies. So that in itself tells you that there would have to be modifications to that sort of district council that we're referring to. Perhaps constituency council might be more appropriate. That said, if you also look at the, the parliamentary system that we have, that we've inherited from the UK, it is one where the government always maintains control, whether it's your public accounts committee, whether it's your rate of interest, or whether it's going to be your district, district council. They are going to appoint the majority of members to that group. So it is going to be a government-controlled body. You throw one or two opposition members on there just to make everybody feel good. My concern about that council as well is that you're going to end up where it just becomes a simple buffer between the politicians, which is just another reason, arguably, that it may not necessarily be held accountable. So do I agree that you should have one? Yes, but I think there would have to be some serious modifications as far as I'm concerned to really ensure that the person's, the public voice is going to be heard and that something is going to be done about that voice. Thank you. Please stay with us. We'll be right back after the short break, this short commercial break. Elite Marble and Granite exclusively introduces Santa Margarita Quartz. Elegant and resistant, Santa Margarita Quartz is the ideal surface for high traffic and everyday use. It can also be up to 25% cheaper than Caesar Stone and Sile Stone. Santa Margarita is exclusively by Elite throughout the entire Caribbean with the largest stock in quartz. Call 945-9028 or visit us online at Elite.ky. Elite Marble and Granite, where perfection costs less. Get ready to laugh as TV's funniest hidden camera show will have you in stitches. Just for laughs, the Laugh Out Loud comedy show catches unsuspecting people in some of the funniest situations. It's just for laughs and it's only here on Cayman 27. Are you looking for amazing deals, great products, or instant cash? Then look no further than Cash Wiz. We sell quality, pre-owned items at amazing prices, such as cell phones, laptops, jewelry, high-end watches, cars, boats, and so much more. We also buy items. Just got the latest smartphone and not sure what to do with your latest model? Then bring it to us for instant cash. In need of some quick cash but don't want to sell your items? Then use our buyback option. We will purchase your item at a price and then hold it for 30 days which then you can buy the item back within the time frame or pay a fee to extend the time period. Almost any item can be used. We also offer a layaway program. See an item that you like but need extra time before purchasing? Then pay 25% down and we'll hold the item for up to 90 days. We can also sell items for you. Cash Wiz, visit us today.
Welcome back to the Cayman Islands Further Education Center, where we have two of the four Georgetown West candidates with us, Mr. Elio Solomon and Mr. Denny Warren, Jr. We've gone to, through a couple of rounds of questions. This is the final round of questions, and I'll turn it back over to Mr. Biles. Thanks, Will. Our next question concerns uh, employment, and I will start with Mr. Solomon. Other than employment, in fact, the question doesn't address employment at all. Other than employment, what opportunities will you seek to provide in your district? Other than what? Other than employment, what other opportunities will you seek to provide in your district? Well, I mean, use the term opportunities, very wide, but again, I, I think I'd perhaps have to recap a little bit of some of the things I've talked about. Well, clearly, I, I, I want to make sure that I can provide a better standard of living for the people within my community. I think one of the first ways we can do that, yeah, we all talk about trying to, to elevate person's salary, but there's, there's certain limitations we have in that area, but I definitely believe we can limit costs, we can reduce the costs. And that's where I talked about having a program that I've already started working on where we can work on putting solar energy panels on many homes who, who are willing to take it and actually reduce person's cost to arguably about 10% of what it is right now is the standard figures. And again, I have even persons who have expressed interest in investing in that sort of thing. Additionally, I would also say what stops us from being able to invest our pensions and, and things like that as well. So those would be some of the opportunities in terms of reducing costs. Again, I want to work and create a better, a better community. I want people to be able to have that, that family feel and everybody's looking after one another. I want to make sure that there's opportunities that you can walk in the street without feeling like you're going to be mugged, regardless of what time of the day or night it is. So I think I'm just recapping, if anything, a lot of the things that I've already mentioned. But those are some of, and, and trying to avoid the employment piece, those are some of the opportunities I'd like to provide for those constituencies in Georgetown West and, and, and all of the other constituencies as well, in fact. Thank you. Mr. Warren, same question. Other than employment, what other opportunities will you seek to provide in your district? I think the word other is the operative word there. And I would <coughs> say that I would like the despair, the doubt, the fear, the anxiety that people feel, the pessimistic views that are held by many people about what can be done in Cayman. I'd like, I'd like to see if I could change their minds about that pessimistic um, skepticism about what is possible. Because I believe that if we have our, our people understand the, the context in which we really live in and that things are really up to us. An example is some people I've heard say, I don't know who to vote for. There's not many options in District A or B or whatever. What am I going to do? Well, I would like to say to people that I, I would like to see that view change so that they would think, well, if I don't see someone that I like, perhaps I should take the initiative and f identify someone and see if that person would be willing to stand for office and, and be someone that they would be willing to vote, vote for. I would, like to, I would like to see people believe again that things are possible because there's just too much skepticism about anything being possible. And if you believe that you can do something, I think you can. And, and, and the things that you want done, I'd like to be your representative in getting it done. Thank you. Our next question concerns a group of stakeholders that are often neglected. And I will start my question with Mr. Warren. What programs would you implement to ensure that our elderly have a better quality of life? I would ensure that the pension law uh, properly funds retirement. I would 
ensure that generations uh, in the future have access to information that would cause them to be cognizant of the importance of putting aside provisions for the elder times in their life much earlier so that they could take advantage of the, the compounding effect uh, over time, over a long period of time. I would, for the, for the immediate future where, where the elderly doesn't have that time, I believe that, that we should l identify those who lack the ability to take care of themselves properly. And I think we should do something about it because it's simply the right thing to do. And whether that be seeking funding uh, uh, generally or just appropriating funding from government, whatever the, the, um, the methods are, I think we should care for those persons um, just be simply because they're human beings and not because they've done a particular thing and therefore we look up to them, just, but just simply because they're humans. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, what programs would you implement to ensure that our elderly have a better quality of life? Um, Mr. Biles, you know, I, I had a saying after having become a parent, and, and that saying was, nothing in life prepares you for children. Children prepare you for life. Because having had my children, my three wonderful daughters, I came to realize and recognize even more so the gravity of how important and the wonderful things that my parents did for me when I couldn't do for myself. To think that anything could have happened and I had my everything, their trust. I had their trust when I didn't even know who I had to trust. They looked after me and I say that because every one of us, when we talk about these elderly peoples, they're somebody's parent. And I don't know about anyone else, but I definitely want to make sure that I, I pay my respects and look after my parents. As, as somebody said, once a man, twice a child, look after them when they arguably can't look out for themselves. So I definitely want to push, as I mentioned earlier on, for things like free medical care is what I'm going to push for. Reach for the stars, even if I reach the moon. But free medical care for, a younger, for elderly people. I think particularly at this age, they need to have lower cost on drugs. They need to have to make sure that they can, you know, be treated properly and hopefully arguably those free costs. In addition to that, I, I believe strongly we should look at being able to construct an adult center where a lot of those elderly persons can mix and mingle with each other, reminisce, they can sit and chat, they can play dominoes, and even be able to fraternize a little bit with younger persons as well. I think being able to have that is extremely important. I think another point which is on the psychological side is when they get up in that age and chatting with them, you can see how thirsty they are to talk to other persons. They need to be able to have people to talk to, and they need to be recognized for the wonderful things that they have done. And I think I've been doing that for the last three years just with vision. It touches my heart, and I know how important it is to them. So I think those are some of the things I would like to do very succinctly for our elderly persons. We will start with you, Mr. Solomon, on the next question concerning a topic that we have touched on, I think twice so far, um, but in a different manner, coming directly from the public. We have seen a shift in the percentage of tertiary educated Caymanians over the past decade. We are not seeing that skill set reflected in senior positions in either public or private sectors. What will you do to promote greater upward mobility for Caymanian professionals. And this is public or private or both? Both. Again, I, I really believe in large part, my understanding is from, the, from having looked at it, the business staff and plan, for example, where you're talking specifically about companies, because clearly there are a lot of jobs that many of our people do not want. And I don't really think there's, there's necessarily a problem with that. But, and that's not to say they should be discouraged, but the type of job particularly that they are interested in the business staff and plan, if it is done properly and if it is enforced, I believe will allow for that mobility. I think what we have, unfortunately, is too many persons that are, are too buddy-buddy, let's put it that way, with a lot of individuals, a lot of companies, and those things are simply not being enforced. So between Section 8 of the Labor Law, as I mentioned earlier on, and the business staff and planning, 
uh, with a little bit of tweaking, I think we can get a lot of Caymanians in there, getting them up the ladder, and also giving them a greater sense of security, knowing that they're going to be protected within those companies and not necessarily constructively dismissed on redundancies or, or otherwise. So that's what I would do there. And I think on the government side, I think similar efforts can be made. It is encouraging to see that the overwhelming large majority of persons within the civil service are Caymanians. It is unfortunate to see some of the salaries that they make, but that's a good thing. And so I think you need to also have the same processes within the government. You need to strengthen up the arm a little bit of the Civil Service Association so that they can have a little bit more teeth and not just a lot of bark, so that we can also make sure that Caymanians have that same mobility. Because having worked in the government for 13 years, I can tell you, there is not necessarily all of that mobility. There's a lot of young and talented persons that are not really being given the opportunity as well. Thank you. Mr. Warren, same question. We have seen a shift in the percentage of tertiary educated Caymanians over the past decade. We are not seeing that skill set reflected in senior positions in either public or private sectors. What will you do to promote greater upward mobility for Caymanian professionals? If I was elected and if I was a minister, I would agitate for us to have a development plan, not just a physical development plan, but a plan that includes having policies about uh, doing that. I would seek to implement a cap on the number, an annual cap on the number of persons who could um, attain PR or status. We cannot take and absorb an unlimited number of persons into the island. We need to have a more disciplined approach to our development. I'm not suggesting that a crisis should be created for businesses in terms of work permits and so forth. I'm talking about moving individuals from the position of being a work permit holder to having status and, and therefore the rights and obligations that come along with that. I've seen after the mass status grants that took place previously where individuals um, who obtain status simply went out and started businesses and competed with those that they were working for at the time to the dismay of those who were in business. And if we think that it's any different by simply having a policy that just grants as many as you feel like uh, is not going to have an impact on us and that they simply won't move into positions and have a right to be in those positions because what it means to have status is, is it means to be a Caymanian. And the definition of a Caymanian under the immigration law is a person who has Caymanian status. And so they, we, they will attain the rights to take those positions. I'm not, I'm not saying that people shouldn't be allowed to get status, not at all. Thank you. Our next question, we will start with you, Mr. Warren. Um, what would you do specifically if elected to address the cost of living for the average Caymanian? I would improve the efficiency of government. I, I see that government is perhaps one of the biggest drags on the economy. Um, and not, not saying that the services that government provides are not necessary, but I would want to ensure that those serve goods and services that are provided are are done so at the most efficient in the most efficient way because the size of government budget would have a significant impact uh, um, on on the lives of individuals if it didn't exist and so if we could reduce that as opposed to seeking new forms of revenue I, I favor um, reducing uh, red tape wherever it's unnecessary. I'm not saying that, that regulation is, is unnecessary. I'm saying unnecessary and excessive regulation 
should be eliminated wherever possible. Thank you. Same question to Mr. Solomon. What would you do specifically if elected to address the cost of living for the average Caymanian? Let me take it in the order of water, food, shelter, health, and government. First of all, on the water side, while I was in government, there was this whole issue about the sale of water authority, and people were proposing that we sell it off to private hands, and even worst case, persons from outside the country. Needless to say, I don't agree with that. But what I do agree with is that the water authority could be sold, and it could be sold and should be sold to our own Caymanians via their pensions. And first of all, we're that's not going to deal with the, the cost of living, and it's definitely going to make them know that they own a piece of Cayman. They've been promised it for a long time, but where's the actual ownership? I want them to know that every time they turn the tap on, they're making money for themselves in terms of retirement. Let's talk about food. As I mentioned earlier on, I see no reason why what happens now is you go to Honduras and you drive for miles and you're seeing all the dole bananas. The dole bananas, for example, get shipped to the United States. We wait, we wait for them to come to the Cayman Islands. That particular in, uh, intermediary process is going to make sure that our costs are going up. We can go directly to those companies. I think we need to be able to do that, increase the shipping, get go directly, and also, as I've mentioned earlier on, I see no reason why we can't even engage in perhaps purchasing some of those companies so that we can make additional revenues from the export as well. In terms of shelter, I've done things like the pension to be able to give people an opportunity to be able to purchase their home, but I would also like to reiterate what I talked about earlier on, for example, about the solar panels, again, being able to reduce people's costs in terms of actually their energy, arguably down to 10%. As I mentioned early on about health, I'm going to push for medical research. Medical research is going to create wonderful opportunities. But in addition to that, what we're talking about is just like we did with Dr. Shetty, also being able to offer remedies to our people at even lower cost than they would get anywhere arguably in the rest of the world. From the government perspective, I've also proven via e-government that we can reduce cost. As I've talked about, the one process at the prison, reducing it by 2.8%. I had the, the whole plan, for example, in terms of how we go about getting our police records and our passport. So clearly, e-government is one of those ways of improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the government service and thus reducing the cost. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll start with you, Mr. Solomon. We'll see where you both stand on one of the biggest infrastructure debates in the past decade in this country. Mr. Solomon, what is your position on the construction of a cruise birthing facility in Georgetown? Again, I believe that there are, there are issues in terms of persons. One, we accept whether they believe we need a port and where they should have it. Again, I want to encourage the public to recognize that we have approximately 1.7 um, million cruise tourists that come to the country, and we're getting about 308 or something thousand in terms of arrivals via the stayovers. But there is a synergy, there's a symbiotic relationship between cruise tourists and those persons who come and stay over as well. Arguably, we say about a 2% transfer rate. So don't think that it's not serving a purpose. And in addition to that, there are thousands of persons that make their livelihood from cruise tourism. Anything we can do to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of getting those persons off of that cruise ship is going to benefit this country. Cruise tourists, according to the exit survey, spend about $127 per head, $127 per head when they come, off, come on shore. What's happening right now is because of the present situation, half of them are staying on the ship. That means we, are, we actually have about $75 million sitting on the ship, or as we would say, dead in the water. We need to be able to allow those persons to dock up, come over, and spend money within this economy, creating opportunities for our people. That's what we need. And in addition, when we talk about improving the cargo or, or the, the port, it wasn't just about the cruise. It was also about cargo. One of the major costs that we have in this country is about cargo. We can't even accommodate large ships in this country because you have to get smaller ships because of the size of the cargo dock. So by going ahead and building a proper facility to accommodate cruise tours and to accommodate larger ships, etc., is going to mean lower costs in terms of our goods, and in addition to that, it's going to mean at least, arguably, another $75 million being spent into this economy. And by the way, we should multiply that number by at least five to get an idea of the economic spend altogether. Thank you. Mr. Warren, same question. What is your position on the construction of a cruise birding facility in Georgetown? Because the government has not released its final plan, 
I don't know the full scope of what is being uh, proposed. And as a result of that, it's hard for me to say whether I agree with what it is that the government is doing. Um, obviously, I would, if, if elected, would have to consider what the views of the constituents are. I would have to consider what the environmental impact would be. Um, and as a result of that, uh, would have to simply make a decision. I don't think we're going to get out of cruise uh, tourism altogether. So even, even if, Pete, if the constituents were to take the position that they didn't want it built, then you would still have crews to some extent. Now, there are differing views about whether that um, is going to be viable in the long term. I would think that there has to be an engineering way in which we could deal with the, uh, the environmental concerns. But at this particular juncture, because I don't know what methods of, for example, dredging is going to be used. My understanding is that one type, it's not that one type of dredging doesn't do any harm and another does. I'm told that one type does one degree of damage and another does a different degree of damage. And so I would have to look at the, the full scope of the project before I could say where I would take a position on that. Thank you. Well, that concludes question time. So I'd like to thank both candidates. We've gone through many questions and thank the audience for some very good questions as well. So when we return, we'll have the closing remarks by both our Kansas candidates this evening. So please stay tuned. Elite Marble and Granite exclusively introduces Santa Margarita Quartz. Elegant and resistant, Santa Margarita Quartz is the ideal surface for high traffic and everyday use. It can also be up to 25% cheaper than Caesar Stone and Sile Stone. Santa Margarita is exclusively by Elite throughout the entire Caribbean with the largest stock in quartz. Call 945-9028 or visit us online at Elite.ky. Elite Marble and Granite, where perfection costs less. Waste Carriers is your complete waste management company. We service commercial, residential, and construction properties. With our large inventory of dumpsters and grapple truck services, we provide an unmatched, dependable service. Our sister company, Island Recycling, buys and collects recyclables such as AC units, aluminum cans, auto batteries, copper, and much, much more. For Cayman's Waste and Recycling Solution, one call takes care of it all. Call 946-DUMP. That's 946-3867. You might not often see us, yet we're always passing through, hidden in the background of everything you do. Who are we? We're Home Gas. The clear choice. Welcome back to the Cayman Islands Further Education Center, where we have two of the four candidates for Georgetown West. We've gone through questions from both the chamber and our audience, and the general public. We've reached a stage in the forum where we give each candidate some a time for closing remarks, and we'll begin as our candidates are seated, first with Mr. Elio Solomon. 
Again, Will and Mr. Biles, I'd like to thank both of you for organizing this particular program. And again, thank the Chamber generally for what you've been doing for at least three decades. And I think it is very, very important to be able to give the public an opportunity to have this level of transparency where they can actually see and hear their candidates and be better informed so they can actually make an informed decision. It is in that same vein, again, that I will stress that I think it is unfortunate and quite frankly disrespectful that we didn't have two of the candidates from the respective parties come here today and to be able to engage in that same level of transparency. That is very unfortunate. I would also take this opportunity to thank my colleague who did show up and show that, uh, again, I, I respect the fact that he did that. And irrespective of what the outcome is going to be in this election, I would like to say that I think I'd be quite comfortable being able to work along with this gentleman as well. I'd like to take the opportunity to chat particularly with all the persons in this country, but particularly those in Georgetown West, and to say that the reality of the situation is, is that if tomorrow we were going out and we were going to be hiring someone to do the electrical work, for example, in our house, we would make sure and choose someone that was, and we would choose that position very carefully. We would choose it very carefully because we know if we choose the wrong person, we could end up with a house that's being burnt down. And where that's very, very important, I can tell you that's just the house, even more so our country. You have a bigger decision to make, and that decision is going to be who are you going to be sending to Parliament to go ahead and to represent you. And when you go to choose your electrician, one of the things you're going to want is to be able to look at that person's resume and say, show me some proof that you've done some things. Show me what you've accomplished, because that helps us to be able to make a good, sound decision that this person can follow through. I hope that amongst other things this evening that you will be able to look at myself and be able to see that I'm a candidate who has served in office and even outside of office and has done a lot for the people of this country. Not as much as I would like to do, but I think that I've done quite a bit. And just to recap very quickly on some of those things, like affordable homes, I talked earlier on about the prison link that saved the government $2.8 I talked about the pension amendment that has put over $400 million to spend in the economy. I talked about the e-government board, the e -CID, which can go to create things like national ID. I talked about the port project. I talked about the pride cleanup, also involved with the Dr. Shetty Hospital, a myriad of different things of which the bell, unfortunately, won't allow me to talk about. But let me just say, I'm kindly asking you for your opportunity on May 24th to be able to represent the people of the Cayman Islands, and particularly the area of Georgetown West. And if you do that, you shall not regret it. I'm going to make Georgetown West, one, the medical capital of the Cayman Islands and the greatest little constituency that we have, and make the Cayman Islands the greatest little country in the world. Mr. Denny Warren, Jr. Thank you, Will, Mr. Biles chamber, audience, and those who are at home uh, who have taken the time to watch this program and to inform yourselves. I believe that I am the better choice for Georgetown West, not because I possess any special skills that make me better than anyone else. I consider myself just an ordinary person with the de determination and uh, silly enough to believe that I could make a difference. I care about people and I want to see people prosper. I want to see their lives be better. And I think that if I had the authority and the opportunity to do so, I could do so. I know that uh, you know, some people would, might be skeptical but I think that I've demonstrated the understanding of the political system, the administration of government, and the processes that one must operate within in order to make things happen. Um, I wasn't in the Legislative Assembly, and I was able, with the help of the public, that's the most important part. It wasn't me. It was that the public supported it. And, and, and that support made it happen. And I think that together, going forward, we can do even greater things if we believe and if we work together, if we communicate with one another about what it is we want to achieve. I believe that the stumbling blocks that people perceive 
that would prevent us from doing things are just in our minds. And if we shake that off, we can do great things. Really, really great things. I want to be your representative. I have, I have demonstrated way back in time an interest in the public. I still have that passion today. I do it in various ways, not for any personal gain. It's simply about the benefit of the Cayman Islands. And on May 24th, I'm asking the public to go to the polls and vote for Denny Warren Jr. Thank you. I'd like to thank both candidates as well as the audience. And now I'll turn it over to Chamber President-elect Paul Biles for some closing remarks. Thank you, Will. On behalf of the Chamber Council, I would like to extend a special thanks to the candidates for participating in tonight's forum. And very importantly, to the audience who have taken the time to attend as well as to submit the questions. We hope that the voters here this evening and watching at home feel more informed about positions of the various candidates. I certainly feel more informed about the candidates, and guess what? I'm a Georgetown West constituency member. I would like to thank Hurley's Media for broadcasting tonight's forum live to the Cayman Islands public via Cayman 27, and also to thank our supporting sponsors, the DART organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings, and Puritan Cleaners. The next Candidates Forum will take place tomorrow evening at the Church of God on Captain Reginald Parsons Drive. The West Bay Central candidates will include Captain Eugene Ebanks and Miss Catherine Ebanks Wilkes. Please do remember to visit caymanchamber.ky for news on the elections and our forums. You can find voting and voter ID collection locations on our site as well. Thank you so much for supporting the Chamber of Commerce candidate forums, and please have a good night. to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Welcome to Let's Talk Sports, brought to you by Elite Marble & Granite. My name is Jordan Arbenice, and we've got an incredible show for you this evening. Let's take a look at our starting line.